Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we bring you up close and personal with some of Canada's most exciting and vibrant communities. My name is Christopher Brown, and I'm your host for this exciting journey. Over the course of this series, we'll be sitting down with local elected leaders from communities all across Canada. We will learn about who they are, what drives them, and how they are working to make their communities a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, we believe that the best way to understand a community is to talk to the people who actually live and work in those communities. That's why we are honored to have today's guest. Please help me welcome to the show, Councillor Catherine McCook of the City of Beaumont in the province of Alberta. Councillor Kat, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I definitely um, appreciate you also giving counselors the opportunity across the board to chat with people. I think sometimes, especially in our smaller communities, the mayor is really the face. And as, as counselors, we don't really talk publicly too often on these kinds of platforms. So I appreciate that. And we have to remember, mayors only get one vote, just like a counselor. So at the yes, end of the day, every true. vote matters. <laughs> Every vote matters. That's right. <laughs> so, Catherine, I want to start with the question, the age old question that starts off all my interviews. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from? My sense of duty to serve. So I guess that kind of um, goes back a little bit of a ways. Um, so I previously worked in nonprofits and worked in the human services field. And that's kind of when I started to really get interested in um, politics a little bit because the nonprofit world, um, politics and policy decision making weighs heavily on programs. And I really saw how a lot of these policies can impact some really great programs, either in a good way or a bad way. And um, so I really decided to become more politically involved and more politically engaged, um, just seeing that. And then I also grew up with a sister who's developmentally disabled. And so um, I watched my mom for years fight for funding and access and services and um, I kind of thought, you know, if I could ever have an impact on on something like that and make somebody's life or somebody's family's life easier, how impactful would that be? So that's kind of where I started um, my journey down. And then through the years, just more and more so. And as I had kids, you know, I realized how impactful some policies can be around growing families and stuff like that. And so, um, yeah, that's kind of where I started going down the path. So growing up, did you ever think that you'd ever be a politician? Because you could have given back through a nonprofit like you did. You could have given through back through volunteerism, but you chose the political route in 2021. Was young Catherine, uh, Catherine a idealist of thinking, I'm going to be a politician one day? Not at all. No, <laughs> not at all. It did Was not politics happen. discussed at the dinner table, though? Pardon? Was politics discussed at the dinner table? Yes, often. Municipally? Often they were. Municipally? Yeah. Not as much, no, because, um, yeah, and I think that's a little bit of a gap is sometimes people don't really realize how strongly municipal politics impact their lives. And I think that's when, when I started to have kids, how I realized how strongly municipal politics impact our lives. And, you know, from building schools to parks to, you know, diverse housing options and stuff like that. And, um, I think when I had a family and I spoke more about politics and stuff like that, you know, my husband was really the one who encouraged me and said, Kat, like, why don't you get involved? And so that's when I really started to look into it. And I think for me personally as well, um, when I really dug into it in my community in Beaumont um, and I started looking at the council and everything at the time, the council at the time didn't I didn't see myself represented so at the time that we have six councillors one mayor and there was one woman on council and no one that represented um moms or women with young families and so I really saw that as a gap and especially in our community we're a very young community as well so I think that um we, we really needed to be represented on there for sure so what happened in 2021? Because you, the first kick of the can that I can find that you enter into the political arena is 2021 and you win that election. So mm -hmm. what was it about that time, that election that you said to yourself, OK, Kat, now is the time to get involved. We can't wait another four years or we should have done it four years ago. 2021 is the year that I'm going to put my name on the ballot. What was happening at that time for you? 
Yeah, there's a variety of circumstances. I think at that time I was um, on maternity leave. So I, when I decided to put my papers in, I had a five month old where some people are like, wow, what were you thinking? <laughs> Having such a young child too. I have a toddler who's four and a half as well. Um, and jumping into municipal politics, but uh, the way I looked at it, it was kind of the perfect time because I was on maternity leave. So, you know, to be able to run my campaign and everything, I had a little bit of that extra um, time and flexibility. And then, you know, four years, you feel like it, not a lot can happen in four years, but a lot can happen in four years, <laughs> as we can see. And so um, I just thought it was a great time. We needed the I felt we needed the the younger mom voice on council um, as our city was progressing. And um, so I felt like, why not? And for Did you me think you had a pulse on the community? Did you think you knew what the issues were of the community? Because you bring a unique perspective to the council table, being that young mother of a, a, a woman who's raising two children with a husband. But was there issues that you were interested in talking about when uh, knocking on doors and actually if you were elected in that election you thought okay I'd be the best person to advance this because I bring this perspective yeah absolutely I think um, it's funny because at the time when I ran I had pink hair um, <laughs> and and then so I, I ran with it and I had pink signs bright pink signs and I had a fairly progressive um, platform, I'd say. So for me, it was about really staying true to what I saw the gaps were in our community and what I thought I could bring forward. Um, and then I, you know, let the community decide whether they they see that and they feel the need for that or not. So one of the things, the important things on my platform was the equity, diversity, and inclusion um, perspective. And I think a lot of that comes from my nonprofit background and my background with my sister and um, different things like that. And then sustainability was really important to me. Long-term sustainability for our community as well. Um, not just, you know, I think a lot, a little bit of a failure in politics sometimes is that um, people focus a lot on their four-year term and don't focus as much on the long-term sustainability for their community, for their province, for the country, whatever it may be. And so for me, when I got into it, that was something that was really important to me. And so in our community, one of the things is we're really heavily reliant on our residential tax base. And so that was something that um, I really push for growing our uh, commercial tax base to be able to even out um, our tax reliance, I guess, a little bit. And then we're going well to talk about some of those issues in a few seconds, but I want to pick up on something that you just talked about here. Mm -hmm. The last election was in that COVID bubble where you couldn't do the traditional door to door door knocking, but you still had to engage with voters to earn their votes. Mm -hmm. When you were out knocking on doors, you had an idea of what the city was going through. But when you mm -hmm. actually talk to people, it's a completely different realm that you get into. Mm -hmm. When you were talking to people, were there issues being raised at the door that you hadn't even thought that were a, of an issue? But when they were brought to your attention, you went, wow, I didn't realize people in our city were going through these challenges or these issues. Not as much, to be honest, Chris. I think a lot of the issues, a lot of people agreed on, you know, the the reliance on the tax base. There, there was a lot of, you know, differing views when it came to COVID and how previous council dealt with COVID. You don't say, counselor, <laughs> you don't say. <laughs> Who didn't? <laughs> but um, I think other than that, a lot of people see the same, um, feel the same things. Uh, just a little bit on a spectrum, though, of how they feel it and, and what way they feel it and whether they agree with the, the direction that I think, you know, some people ask me, you know, I want someone who's fiscally responsible. Is that going to be you? Um, and so were there more macro issues than micro issues, would you say? Absolutely. Yeah. Really? You. This is yeah. a fascinating conversation that I'm having right now, because this is a reoccurring theme that I thought municipally it would be more micro issues, but 
counselors and mayors like yourself are telling me no it's all about the macro issues i'm like shockingly impressed that people are actually talking about macro issues at the municipal level mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and i don't know if it's more that people are paying more attention to the provincial and federal type of politics so they're kind of applying some of those mac- macro issues into municipal politics did you get um, the provincial or federal issue questions at the door when you were talking to people during that campaign like the healthcare questions that, oh, what are you going to do about our healthcare system? Well, that's not a municipal issue. Yes. Yes, for <laughs> yeah. sure. So you're relatively the same that every other counselor and mayor has talked about yeah. as well. Yeah, definitely. Healthcare. Um, and interestingly, not as much housing, but housing is an important issue across the board. But not as many people were concerned or worried about that. Um. But definitely healthcare is a big one, just affordability in general. Um, and then some people got into a little bit of the micro issues. We need a new high school in our community. So there was a lot of push and support for that and questions around um, that kind of stuff. But So I want to take you back to election day, uh, October 2021, election night. You go in, you cast your ballot if you cast your ballot on election day. We all remember the first time you see your name on a ballot, you get to put the X beside it. What was that experience like for yourself? Yeah, it was really exciting to go in. Um, You know, being as someone who is new to the game, um, you know, it was exciting to go in. I I had friends and stuff who who went in and and called me after that they were excited um, to see my name on the ballot and everything. And um, that night we had dinner with uh, my parents and uh, my in-laws and we were just waiting. And the count actually took a really long time that evening as well. And it was just, I wasn't sure where I was going to land. Like I said, I was on a little bit more of the progressive side with pink signs. And, um, you know, it definitely got me noticed. A lot of people were asking questions about the girl with the pink signs. Um, So that was good and a good conversation starter. Um, But all the um, incumbents were running. One of the councillors was running as a mayor position. So you never know where things are going to land when incumbents run as well. So, But at the end of the day, you get elected. That blue check mark goes beside your name. If, if I'm not mistaken, and I'm assuming you will know this verbatim, you are the second top earner of votes for the councillors. It was you and then someone else who had the most votes overall for your uh, city. Is that correct? No, I was last. Okay, maybe Global News got it wrong then. Maybe this is why I should not do much research yeah. on Global News. <laughs> that's okay. There's a ca- The other councillor, though, is Kathy. Oh, probably Ooh, I just... Maybe that's why. Okay, probably. Yeah. I apologize, but you're last. Yeah. Uh, not not yeah. last, but you, you're the last person who gets the vote. Yeah. That moment, yeah. you get the blue check mark. What goes through your head? Oh, my goodness. It was so exciting. And just seeing the makeup of our council as well, I was really excited to see who made it. I was disappointed for some people as well. Um, You know, I chatted with a lot of other um, candidates running and we had some really uh, incredible people running. But I was excited for the council that made it on and thrilled. And then also, okay, now so I how have long, to how long does that take? How long does the excitement take to turn to, oh, crap, now the real work begins? <laughs> I would say, like, probably the next morning when I woke <laughs> up after, like, you know, you know, you know, you know a couple drinks, maybe. Or, no, I'm just kidding. But, um, you, but, but yeah. you get elected. Now the real work does begin. Mm -hmm. The decisions now you make at council are going to affect people's pocketbooks. They're going to affect their day-to-day lives because we always forget municipal politics is the closest politics to you. Your water, your garbage, your roads, you deal with them on a regular basis, Mm -hmm. basis as council. Mm -hmm. How important was it for you to put the weight and responsibility to make sure that the decisions you make are in the best interest of the entire community? And do you still have that weight on you every time you walk into that council chambers? Absolutely. I think it's, you know, you you have to play that balance of people come to you with certain issues. And while that issue impacts them in that moment, when you're a counselor, you still have to step back and realize, while I empathize with your issue, particularly, 
you may not be able to fix or change that issue because I need to look at it as the entire city and how does this impact the entire city and I guess that goes back to my sustainability piece as well um, you know making decisions for the long term and I think for myself, when I got elected, I wanted to be a voice. Obviously, I think all politicians say that. Um, but I also really wanted to be a voice for people who don't always have a voice, for the people who aren't always listened to and the people who don't always um, have the people advocating for them. And in addition to that, I really wanted to, I think as elected officials, you know, we have to educate ourselves on issues. City administration brings us reports the public comes to us with issues and often there is a disconnect between the two. So as elected officials, we kind of have to marry the two and make decisions. For me personally, I take it very seriously. And I, when I don't understand an issue or I'm not very clear on an issue, you know, the public saying one thing and they're over here and administration may be saying another thing and they're over here. Who is an understanding what or what is best for the community? So for myself, you know, an example is we're um, digging into our land use bylaw a little bit and um, which is always a fun I topic. love the land use bylaw because it's the I most know. complicated, not complicated thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Isn't it? Isn't it? Oh, it is quite the topic. Let me tell you. Um, so for myself, I was like, I need to know more about this. So I went about and I've read three books around city planning, community building, all that kind of stuff to be able to be really ready for those conversations when they happen um, later this year. And I think it's important as an elected official to do that as well to just learn that much more um, about a topic so we can make those decisions learning about something and actually voting on something are two different things because you can learn about something until you're red in the face but at the end of the day you have to make the decision and you can learn about what that decision might should be or would be but you have to make the ultimate decision for you, and this is just a conversation because we brought it up, I want to make sure I get this uh, sort of asked, how important is it to take all perspectives into consideration, but also remember that you have to defend your decision, whether it be good or bad, after that vote is done? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really important. And I can tell you, there are some times where I, you know, I'm going to vote and I'm thinking, oh, this one's going to be a tough one. Um, more tough one sometimes publicly. However, I feel confident in my decision. I just know that that it may be tougher um, once I face the public about it. But once again, I think it goes back to educating myself on the issues and on the issues in the community. Um, I try a lot to go on my Instagram stories and just kind of engage with people and connect with people. Just this past week, we we have a report coming out about um, our sign. And so I engaged people as to what our options are and um, just to gather some feedback and stuff like that. So um, I think for me, approaching these decisions from an empathetic perspective, but also with a strong ethical perspective is important. And I feel that if I've done the research and I've looked deep into it and I've looked at the sustainability piece for the long term. Is this going to benefit my community in the long term? This may be tough right now, but is this what's going to be the best? Um, and, you know, at some point you have to make your decision and you have to stick to it. And, you know, that's not always easy for everyone, but... You are municipal councillors and municipal mayors, whether it be Reeves mayors, councillors, are the front line of politics. And we talked about that a little bit before him, but I want to get dig into it a little bit deeper. You mm -hmm. don't go off to Edmonton. You don't go off to Ottawa to do your job. You are doing your job 24-7 in your community. So if you go to the grocery store, you're councillor McCook. If mm -hmm. you go to the library, you're councillor McCook. There are days that you probably just want to be Catherine. There's days that you probably just want to just relax, enjoy family time, but you always are on. For you, how hard has it been to balance that work life as a counselor with mom life and personal life, Catherine? Yeah, it's it's definitely been a challenge. I think um, I think in general, a lot of people, especially in our community, um, the counselor positions are considered part time. <laughs> sure, um, sure. Yeah. I'd love to see that part time counselor. In the right. Right. So I don't think people realize exactly um, how much time 
really goes into it. You know, when you get agenda packages that are 200 and some pages on a Thursday afternoon and you have to be prepared for Tuesday evening, um, that can take up a lot of your time, especially if you're someone like me who has to research a lot of topics throughout um, going through the agenda and making sure that I've kind of covered everything. So yeah, so a lot of us have full-time jobs in addition to the counselor position. And for myself, I'm a parent. Yeah. So it's a balance. There's no doubt, but I have to say um, our community has been really respectful. I know right now it's a very crucial time, I think, especially for women to be in politics. It's a pertinent time for us to be in politics, but it's also um, a little bit of a scary time. Um, there's what, do, what do you mean by that? I'm going to press um, you on that. What do you mean by it's a scary time for women? Because you're not the first woman elected, local elected leader who said that to me. So I want to get your perspective. What does it, what do you mean by it's a scary time? Yeah, I think in general, um, especially, you know, on the equity diversity piece and um, online, there's generally a lot of vitriol kind of swung at politicians. Do you get it? And I was just going to say, I don't, I have not. Yeah. Okay. So I know I was good, good I was on Beaumont. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I was preparing myself going into this, you know, like I told myself, Kat, you have to have a tough skin. You need to be able to um, withstand some of the things that are going to come at you. And I have to say that to the credit of our community, uh, everyone's been really respectful, whether they've seen me in public or even online. You know, there's there's sometimes comments just about council in general and frustrations and stuff like that. But I think that comes with the territory. Uh, but in general, it's been fine. Shocking. Yeah, no, yeah. Not, I'm I'm glad that it's not been bad, but it's shocking to hear that because mm -hmm. you're one of the few that I've not had anyone you not. Uh, one of the few counselors who are women who've come on the show and say, mm -hmm. I haven't felt that negative attack, but mm -hmm. now, Chris, I'm only like a year and a half in. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Wait till you talk about the by land use bylaw. Then there might be yeah. some. <laughs> yeah, that might I joke for change. anyone who's listening. I am joking. Um, yeah, we could probably talk about you for the next hour, but I want to turn to the city now. And before I do that, I want to state this. This is a conversation between the counselor and myself. This is not a motion at council. This is not a direction of council. This is her opinion with the host of the cross border interviews. So we seem to always get emails about this. Not very often, but we, this is the question that seems to piss people off. Pardon my French. <laughs> um, counselor McCook. In your opinion, what is the biggest issue facing the city of Beaumont today as of recording? Without a doubt, I would say it's growth. Um, How growth, so? growth is both an amazing thing, um, but when you have an ex exponential growth as we've had, it can be very challenging. We are uh, the fastest growing city in the metro Edmonton metro region and the third fastest in the province. So Really? That mm -hmm. is shocking. Yeah. Huh. Mm -hmm. I think we used to be second, but we're we're down to third now. But <laughs> um, so if growth is an issue, how do you, as counselor and as a council as a whole, deal with that? Because I'm not going to burst any bubbles here, but I guarantee you, there's the nimbyism factor that plays into this issue in every absolutely. community across this province and this across this country. So how do you, as counselor, deal with sustainable growth while still keeping the feel of your community the way that people may want it to stay, understanding that you need to grow. So that way, while taxes have to go up because of inflation and service levels, it's not on the back of the current residents. Mm -hmm. Chris, I think you hit the nail on the head there when you said, um, <laughs> how do you, um, how do you really sustain it? And that's, that's the difficult part. You know, we, as I mentioned earlier, we're heavily reliant on the residential tax base. And so um, inevitably we need to bring uh, other services in. And I think with that, it's, you need diverse housing is one of the the things. And I what, think- What's the biggest uh, diverse housing, uh, uh, I want to say, not issue, but what's the biggest uh, status or not 
I can't even think of the proper word right now. What's the biggest issue? What's the biggest housing uh, industry area that you'd want to look at? Is it duplexes? Is it single family? Is it low income? Is it affordable? What type of housing are you looking at? Or I all? think that's just it is, is diverse. Um, okay. I'm not sure if you, if you've been to Beaumont, but yes, I have um, once, once, but not like, <laughs> like for 15, 20 like, minutes. Drew, well, we'll talk Drew, about that Drew? later. Yeah. Yeah. So we have beautiful homes, beautiful yards and everything like that. But once again, um, as we're growing one, you know, eventually we're going to run out of space Two, um, also a lot of people have talked about, they want the option to be able to buy certain things in our community that they can't buy, which means bringing in certain stores and stuff like that. Well, in order to have people working at those stores, we have to be able to offer housing for them to live. Right now, transportation is also a, a challenge of ours. So we need those housing um, diversity options. So anywhere from, you know, I don't think we're, we we are looking at, you know, huge towering buildings, but affordable housing is important. Uh, I think our community is, um, a more affluent community, but there are still people in our community who struggle and we still want to be able to welcome those people and we still want them to be able to continue to live here. So Beaumont has always been really known to be a great place to raise a family. Uh, it's a beautiful family community and I think wouldn't it be that much better if we could also provide it as a place for people to work and as a, pe a place for people to age in place, which means offering diverse housing options. So I'm, I'm going to do a little throwback to a statement that you made a little bit earlier in the episode about being the advocate for the people who don't feel like their voices have been heard. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you do that on an issue like growth? Because there may be that nimbyism factor where they're saying, my voice isn't being heard. And you as counselor have to represent everyone. Even if they didn't vote for you, you have to be there to mm -hmm. represent the entire community. How do you see your role in looking at both sides of the issue and respectfully talking to both sides and having that conversation and saying, I would love to help you, but the city needs to grow. And unfortunately, your side isn't going to win this issue. And, I, and I'm just using the words that I would use because I know politicians sure. have better answers than I do, but that's how I would have said it. For sure. And I think that's that's part of going back to the, the educating piece and knowing the intricacies of an issue, uh, especially when we talk about housing. You know, I if we could all build large homes and live on large lots, that would be great. But in doing a lot of research, even, you know, it's not sustainable, uh, especially in our community. I can't speak to other communities, but growth for every dollar of growth, it costs us a dollar 40 to service it, which is significant. So we, I think it's about sitting down and having those conversations about how are we going to pay for this? If we continue to grow at the rate that we're growing without offering those diverse housing opportunities, how are we going to pay for this? And then bringing back the conversation to, you know, we want to bring other stores in and, and most of our residents want to see these other stores come in, but who's going to work at them and how, because our transportation isn't an option either. So where are they going to live? How does the city of Beaumont do that? Because you're not the first, uh, uh, and I'm not bursting your bubble here because I think you should know this, but you're not the only community that's facing growth issues. You're not the only community facing the uh, draw of the economic uh, diversification, whether it be the small mom and pause, whether it be the big box stores, whether it be oil and gas, whatever. Communities are all facing the same issue that you've just mentioned. How does Beaumont stand up and stand out in a crowded field like Alberta's uh, diverse communities that we have? I would say that one of our biggest things is we're innovative and we're open to trying out new projects. Um, I don't know if you heard about Ella. Did you hear about Ella? <laughs> I've heard. I don't know the full details because I try to go into these interviews with an open mind and I'm acting as the resident, but tell, tell me about Ella. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was an autonomous vehicle that was um, used as a pilot project um, and it kind of went up and down our main street and 
Um, a lot of people were frustrated by it, um, but in the end, it brought a lot of um, interest in Beaumont and a lot of interest in what Beaumont can grow to be. So with that, we've, um, we received a 10 gig uh, broadband network, which is significant and it will have the capability to service our current uh, network needs and then scale up to 10 gig, which would make it one of the um, fastest commercially available infrastructures um, globally. So I think bringing in projects like that and bringing those kind of things to Beaumont that are innovative, that are forward thinking. Um, I know people have said, you know, the things you guys talk about, your strategic plan in Beaumont is all really exciting. You guys seem to be really forward thinking. And some of it is that thinking outside of the box. And, um, you know, as you said, we're not the only municipality facing these issues. So we have to think outside the box and how can we bring these services and we need to enhance services in our community to really meet the needs of our community, but also in a way that's affordable, especially in this economic situation. So I want to turn to the people of Beaumont for a second, the residents, your constituency. Mm -hmm. Now, you've talked about growth being your biggest issue that you believe is the biggest issue facing the city of Beaumont. But if I go talk to 100 people, they're going to give me all different issues. They may give me macro issues, like you said, but they're going to give me some micro ones, like a park upgrade or a uh, uh, mm -hmm. pothole in there or a sidewalk upgrade. How do you, as councillor, take the issues that people are talking about, whether it be those micro issues, and then at budget time, look at the best case scenario for the city as a whole? Because John's pothole is the biggest issue that John has, and mm -hmm. Tracy's pothole over here is going to be the biggest issue that she has. But you only have enough money to fill one pothole this year. How do you do that as the city and as the city councillor? Because I can imagine you want to please everyone because you want everyone for their best, the best for their community, but you don't have enough money to please everyone. No, no. <laughs> and, and that's, that's a, a big issue. I think part of it is really asking yourself, what problem are we trying to solve? And then what is going to make the greatest impact across the community as a whole? So, you know, looking at it, some people do come with macro issues and micro issues, but I think a lot of it stem back to, to that growth piece, you know. Um, some people are frustrated with, you know, our police service or our level of, of service um, and feel that we need more. Our protective services, um, you know, we need to add more firefighters and things like that. So some of those are, are maybe more a little bit micro, but then they stem back to the macro piece of the growth piece that we've grown so fast that we just, some of those services we haven't been able to keep up with. So we have to add a little bit at a time. And then I think kind of goes back to being really strategic. So if we don't fund X this year, what does that look like next year? What does it look like the year after? What are the impacts that those have if we don't fund that this year? At the end of the year, if I came and asked you the one question that I have, I'm going to plan on asking a few councillors and mayors, what do you hope to have accomplished by the end of this year for you as councillor, as the city of Beaumont? What is issue X that at the end of this year you want accomplished, you no know, ifs, ands, or buts, or started, or the conversation moved past the first phase and into the second phase? What issue is that for you? Oh, I would probably say it's around healthcare. And I, I know you're probably going to say that's interesting because that's a provincial thing. Shockingly, a lot of people say healthcare and a lot of people understand that it's a provincial issue, but it seems to be more municipal these days. Yeah, it's just, um, you know, all areas of healthcare for us. We aren't, um, you know, but same issues across the board, across the province. We we don't have enough family doctors. We have an ambulance that spends a lot of its time not in our city. Um, and, you know, a lot of the hospitals that we have access to are also full and overflowing. So for us, it's about what are different things that we can do to potentially bring healthcare to our community. So, um, 
you know, I put a motion forward uh, recently, um, kind of looking into Cold Lake had put a motion forward. Um, they are doing a municipally owned corporation and kind of taking over doctor's clinics. So I put a motion forward for us to explore that option. What does that look like for us? Is that something that's feasible? Um, and then in this past budget, another councillor also put a motion forward about um, kind of looking into that healthcare kind of piece as to doing a needs assessment in our community, basically. So what do we need? What would be, you know, some people say an urgent care, some people say just more doctors, clinics. What is it that would best serve our community? So I think really digging into that, making some traction with that, as well as bringing some more big business to our community to help even out that tax base, or at least have um, a larger part of that sorted out would be um, really important. And then on the healthcare piece, I think the mental health part is really important as well. I think sometimes when we think healthcare, we only think physical ailments, but the mental health piece is really important. I wasn't going to bring this question up, but I, I think I think you can handle it because I think you're you're someone who <laughs> understands some issues. This has been a challenging year for budget for a lot of municipalities. The cost mm -hmm. of living has gone through the roof, and mm -hmm. municipalities can't run deficits. No matter what, they cannot run deficit. How hard was it for yourself to look at the issues that were going on in the city, look at the needs of what the city wants or needs? And then look at the budget and say, okay, we either have to raise taxes or we have to cut services. How hard was that for you this year? Interesting. Um, yeah, we actually um, postponed our budget. Um, okay. So if you don't want to, do if you don't want to answer that question, then I can cut. No, this that's out. okay. Just, okay, go ahead. Yeah, we just just finished it last week, so. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. So we went through our deliberations. Um, but I think it was it was difficult. There are a lot of things um, that our administration brought forward that we looked at and said, you know, this is something we really need. And this is something our residents have been asking for. Um, but is this something we can do right now? Or is this something that we can push off to the next year? But you have to be careful when those when you have those conversations in your head, I guess, a little bit, because how long can you push something off to the next year and the next year and the next year till it becomes something that you have to do? And then maybe then taxes need to be raised significantly. So if you do it a little bit each year and you're able to manage that piece, I think that's really important. Um, and then I think planning is important. So one of the pieces is we looked at our firefighters. We need to add to our protective services. But when we looked at it and when we heard from our um, from our director of protective services, we're now going to do a study to determine, you know, looking at protective services as a whole and how we can augment that rather than piecemealing it and hoping that you're getting enough people when you're really not. So it kind of goes back to the planning part and making sure that you have that future planning piece. And I think our administration does a really good job of that. Um, and a really good job of informing us of the future plans as well and not just, you know, make a decision today and hopefully it works out for the next few years. So I appreciate you answering that, uh, Councillor, but I want to cautious of time here. I want to turn to our last topic and it's my favorite topic. Not that I don't enjoy these conversations, but I love tourism. I love visiting communities. I love joining. And I've said on the show, if you come on my show, I will be spending my economic dollars in your community. So get ready to see Chris love Brown it. in Beaumont here <laughs> later this year. But Councillor Kat, um, in your opinion, what are some hidden gems of the city of Beaumont that as tourists, as we have listeners from around the world and across Canada, should come and see in Beaumont? Oh my goodness, we have so many gems. Um, yes. So first of all, <laughs> um, one of the big things that um, has kind of put Beaumont on the map is our French heritage-based restaurant, Chartier. 
Uh, so shout out to the owners, Sylvia and Darren. They've done an incredible job with it. They've won numerous awards. And I know often people come from surrounding communities to have lunch or dinner there. And they have an amazing bakery part as well. So um, definitely have one of their cinnamon buns, which is about like this big. It's huge. Um, but in addition to that, uh, recently the city built um, a multi-use sports field and um, the landscape company, which is, I'm just going to, which was Delta Valley Landscaping, recently won an award for the design of that, um, of our sports field. Also, our Centreville, which is like the center town a little bit, um, is just a really unique area. We have a cute cafe, some cute little boutiques. Um, so it's a great place to go have a coffee and pop into some of the shops. We also have over 40 kilometers, I believe, of interconnected trails. And so it's great to jump on your bike and just, you can weave through the city. And actually, I think that was one thing um, going back to the um, campaign, there were a couple weekends that my husband and I put our my pink hoodies on and popped on our bikes and drove around the city on our bikes and just tried to chat with whoever was out and about. And I think we reached a lot of people doing that. So that was great. Um, we also have our Beaumont Blues and Roots Festival. So that's something that happens once a year, but uh, that's on people's radar. And there's been people from across the country. When is it? It is normally in June. Okay. So it's coming up. So get your By the time out. this airs, I will have the links if it's uh, all the details are out in the show notes for anyone who's listening. Absolutely. Or I will, I I will share it on our social media once it comes out. That would be great. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's an amazing event. So lot it's well attended and from people from all over the place as well. Um, and our Jeff's Cafe, which is uh, in our Centre de Ville, was recently used in a movie. I believe it was a Hallmark movie. So is, just last it, weekend. I have a question because you, 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 is Beaumont a bilingual town? We are. We're very, um, our French heritage is very deep. So we have um, about 10% of our community is still speaks strictly French as their first language. And like our roots are French and we are one of the... Um, one of the recognized bilingual French and bilingual communities. communities. Yeah. Huh. You and Legal. Look at that. Yeah. Look at that. Um, yeah. So Beaumont. is that how you actually pronounce it? Yeah. <laughs> I've been pronouncing it wrong the entire time. Yeah. Oh no. I apologize to the people of Beaumont. <laughs> um, so after a long day for you, where do you go? Where do you go to decompress in the city? Is there a spot that you get out in town and just relax? Yeah, for me, I would say it's probably, we love to ride our bikes. So hopping on the bike and there's, we have lots of um, like little lakes and stuff with benches around and going up to um, the Centre de and hitting up one of the bakeries or something like that um, for a quick bite is definitely something um, that I, that we do often for sure. Counselor, I'm going to ask the million dollar question now, and this is the most important question of the entire interview. And you can take as long as you want to answer this question if you wish. What okay. makes the city such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? I think one of the things that I hear time and time again is community. So people say, we moved here for the community. We moved here for the community feel. You know, we, I know even on my street, I know all of our neighbors, we all go outside and chat. It's, we all are very connected. Um, we have some really amazing events throughout the year as well. Um, we're trying to bring different aspects to them that make them more inclusive. But um, one of our big events is Beaumont Days. And um, a few years ago, was it a few years ago now, maybe less than that, um, we did a street party to um, as a celebration on the Friday night for Beaumont Days. And so many people came out and they were just like, 
it was so great to, you know, kind of post COVID type stuff as well to connect with people and to, you know, run into people. And so we continue with that street party now because it has been such a great connecting event um, throughout our city and people so look forward to that um, weekend and that Friday night street party. And so I think that's a big part of it. We have lots of parks, very, you know, kid friendly. And so people just feel, you know, I've been, I'm going to sound a little corny here, uh, warm and fuzzy <laughs> when they, when they come to our community. Cause I, and I, that's just, you know, what people say time and time again, we have really beautiful homes and some great places for people to live. So now we need to make it a great place where people can work. <laughs> Uh, Councillor McCook, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for sitting down for the last 45 minutes and talking about the city of Beaumont and yourself. So very much appreciated. And I, I, I will say this, your city is better served with you at the council table. So thank you so much for putting your name forward and being elected. Thank you so much, Chris. I really, truly appreciate you having me on. I appreciate the opportunity to chat about Beaumont and municipal politics in general. Mm -hmm. I think it's so important to be able to, you know, talk about some of those things that people don't realize impact them so strongly. So I appreciate uh, the opportunity. So with that, I want to remind everyone, put down social media for at least 10 minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. Helps our society, helps our democracy, and helps us be a better people at the end of the day. So with that, this has been another edition of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, just keep talking. Mm -hmm.